there's little point in having a breeding program to develop improved varieties unless one can develop a seed organization to multiply and distribute the products of that research program. These are Breeders Foundation seed plots. They are widely spaced rows, which permits uh, field workers to go through the plot several times during the course of the season and remove any off types or mechanical mixtures. Uh, this must be kept uh, absolutely pure, as pure as we can make it, and then this seed will leave the experiment station to be multiplied either by government programs or by farmers cooperative organizations as it is done here. One of the bottlenecks to putting these new improved varieties to work on farms to produce more food is the lack of good seed organizations. Uh, here to my right are workers who are removing these off types or mechanical mixtures, which we generally call rogues, uh, to make sure that uh, this basic seed is as pure as possible. But one of the sad tragedies, if you permit me to use that term, of the uh, developing world is that we have been now, I think, in the last 10 years, very successful in developing a lot of good wheat breeding programs. But the corresponding programs in uh, good seed multiplication, seed certification, and uh, storage and warehousing until the next planting season is the weak link in the total chain. Something has to be done about it. As we uh, look ahead uh, to the rapidly growing demands for food to supply the needs of uh, a large and rapidly growing population, we must recognize that in many of the densely populated countries of the world at the present time, there's little opportunity for opening more land for cultivation. So the major emphasis to stay ahead on the food front must be to increase yields per hectare, per unit of time. Uh, this is the only chance they have of uh, producing enough food to improve the standard of living of their people. Now, when we look at this a little closer, we have to recognize there are two parts to this. One is developing the new technology per se, and the second is to connecting or hooking this up with the government food and agricultural policies, which will permit the adoption of that new technology that has the, the potential, if applied, to uh, greatly increase yields and consequently production. These principles apply to all crops, whatever they may be. And if, the, if you're in a temperature uh, range or zone where uh, the, crop, or the temperatures and the moisture is available for growing more than one crop a year, uh, you'll get a double payoff if the technology is developed right. In other words, if you, as was done in India and Pakistan, or for that matter here in Mexico, uh, you learn how to grow wheat with high yield, uh, good technology, backed up by the right policies, uh, government policies on pricing and availability of inputs. Uh, you can not only harvest this crop, but you can move rapidly and plant a summer crop as well. So, uh, it, and uh, the farmer is a very creative guy. Even if all of the research information isn't yet available, he, can, uh, he will improvise. If he's seen the benefits uh, that comes from fertilizing wheat, uh, if he's never fertilized rice, he's going to do it. If the response was big in wheat, with the right research, he'll do it more efficiently, the backup on the fertilizer requirements for rice or for other, any other crop. Let's take a look at this now in uh, the general sequence of events that uh, we must approach when we talk about developing an improved technology. But first, let me uh, prefix that with the fact that uh, the three main factors that will limit food production uh, in the decades to come and determine in a large part whether we will be able to produce the uh, food that's needed is one, land that's uh, 
suitable for agriculture. That is, uh, in areas where there's adequate rainfall or where irrigation water can be brought to supply the water. And uh, thirdly, where the temperatures are favorable for uh, crop growth. These are the three primaries. Now, in many parts of the world where there are dense populations, agriculture is old and yields are very low. Uh, this is generally the result of uh, continuous cropping over hundreds of years of time, uh, removing uh, essential plant nutrients, not replacing them in the soil. And so yields have gradually gone down and down and down. So the first thing we must do is to find out what is needed to restore the nutrients to the level that can produce a good yield of uh, whatever crop you're dealing with. Uh, it's fertilizer. But fertilizer is not just fertilizer. Uh, there are many kinds of fertilizers. You have to, uh, and uh, different soils require different kinds of fertilizer. You must determine which uh, of the nutrients is limiting, and this is done by experimentation on farms and on experiment stations. And then once this is uh, known, you must adjust the levels so that it is most economic uh, from the standpoint of input, input cost uh, versus uh, price of uh, crops sold, yield and price of crop. So soil fertility and soil management becomes uh, very important. Then you have to have the variety. You have to develop and breed a new variety. The old varieties are not adequate. They will lodge, they have low genetic yield potential, and when you change soil fertility, it's a new game. Everything has changed. As soon as you do this, you have to use improved uh, agronomic practices. You must uh, have better seedbed uh, preparation, assuring a uniform stand of plants. Uh, the new variety must be planted at the right season of the year with the right amount of seed. And uh, finally, if it's irrigated agriculture such as this, uh, it must be leveled so that the water can be distributed uniformly. If it's a rain-fed agriculture, especially in the areas where moisture is limiting, then summer fallow practices uh, to conserve that moisture that falls during the rainy season and also to reduce as far as possible losses of moisture from weed growth during summer is equally essential. Uh, and weeds. Weeds are the great competitors of virtually all of the crop plants. Uh, and unless they are adequately uh, taken care of, either by crop rotations and mechanical uh, cultivation or the proper chemical, uh, they will reduce yields 20, 30, maybe even 40 percent. And uh, the new technology is uneconomic without due consideration for weeds. Then, of course, we come to the very complex problems of diseases. In so far as possible, you breed into the variety, resistant to the major pests, but there are at least 30 major uh, diseases of, or weak diseases, some of them more important, some more widespread than others, and you must concentrate on those and uh, do be the best you can on the others. Having developed a new technology that has the capa capacity to increase yield, uh, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent, and sometimes you can see changes of 200 percent on the same land after you have this technology worked out. Then this technology has to be married to sound economic policy that will stimulate production. In other words, the government or has to make the inputs available, the right kind of fertilizer at a reasonable price, there has to be credit, especially if uh, small farmers are to participate, so that they can buy this input and perhaps pay for it at uh, harvest. Uh, in addition, <coughs> uh, there has to be an announcement of a fair price prior to planting by at least two months if it's an annual crop under irrigation, which gives the farmer time to uh, find the input uh, to have it uh, present 
on his farm at time of planting, in the case of fertilizer, or if it's in a fallow system, uh, it has to be uh, more or less uh, a year ahead of time because there's one year without any crop being grown on a given piece of land. Uh, and that pricing policy is very important if the farmer is going to adopt the new technology. There must be capital investment. The government has to decide whether agriculture is important. And since in the developing world, frequently 65 to 85 percent of the population live on the land, uh, it must make the hard decision to invest enough in capital uh, infrastructure to make this possible. Sometimes fertilizer plants, in the early stages, they may import the fertilizer. But if they have the basic raw materials to produce that fertilizer inside the country, at least part of it. Uh, warehouses, when production starts going up, there has to be more storage capacity. And unless this happens, there'll be tremendous after harvest loss, losses. Uh, farm to market roads to move much uh, uh, bigger volumes of produce to markets. And those markets must be close enough at hand so that it uh, the farmer himself, who doesn't have uh, the transport facilities to move it long distances, can reach a, a market, secondary market at least, where, where he can sell uh, without too much of the freight charge going directly against him. The interaction of all of these uh, factors that I've just mentioned will in a large part determine uh, whether the farmers will be able to and willing to accept the new technology. You have to remember that there are certain unknown uh, risks involved when you introduce a new technology. And this means also uh, that uh, after the research work is done on the experiment station, it must be checked out for validity under a wide range of uh, uh, on-farm tests to make sure that there's no error in the technology. If those tests are done properly, they can also serve as a, uh, in a secondary way as demonstration plots uh, to bring far more farmers into contact with them so that they will pick up from their bits of information that will spread through the, uh, the village. Then, of course, finally, uh, there are the f demonstrations that have to be put out in hundreds and I dare say even in thousands of locations. Uh, and they need to be simple enough, uh, but uh, bringing together the main factors that influence yield and production, but not so complicated that the, that the farmer can see how these factors interact. Overcomplication uh, leads to confusion in these types of uh, demonstrations. Uh, now I would like to go back to when we spoke of capital investment, if we are in desert or semi-arid climates, one of the principal capital investments must be uh, for irrigation, which means dams and reservoirs, to store uh, large volumes of water that frequently in the semi-tropics fall in uh, bountiful quantities for a period of two or three months, such as the monsoon season in the subcontinent. And then there's a very long dry period throughout most of the rest of the year. These dams cost uh, great sums of money. Uh, and in order for them to be effective, of course, consideration also has to be given to the watershed. Uh, all too often, the dam, uh, the longevity, of the life of those reservoirs is at the present time only a half to a third of what they were calculated to be because of the deforestation on the upper slopes of the watershed, the erosion and silting which fills up the reservoir and cuts down on the volume stored uh, at a much faster rate than the uh, hydrological studies, engineering studies indicated. So there's a job in management of those watersheds. And it's been one of the disasters uh, of the, let me be frank, of the watersheds of uh, Pakistan, India, Nepal. Uh, and it results not only in uh, silting the reservoirs, uh, but in the un 
Czech River floods during the monsoon season that destroys crops, uh, demolishes uh, villages and kills many people. Now, the case of the Indus is the other extreme. And there are many other places in the world where this is done. Irrigation is old in the Indus. It goes back, as far as the big irrigation works is concerned, in Pakistan to the 1880s. Beautiful engineering works for their time, outstanding. But nothing was known then about water logging and accumulation of salts. And so the result is today that uh, the yields in the most waterlogged soils that are badly uh, now uh, damaged by salt accumulations in the upper uh, areas of the root zone uh, is a growing problem. Drainage is needed, a network of drains to re reduce the uh, level of water below the root zone and at the same time which will permit the leaching out of salts. Uh, by so doing, I'm confident that in many places the response to fertilizer will be doubled and tripled over what it is when you put the same fertilizer on soil, which is today waterlogged and uh, badly damaged from salt. This, the drainage and the watershed protection, the drainage to get rid of the salt, the watershed protection to cut down on rates of silting are integral parts of the proper use of irrigation water. You can't just think in terms of capital investment in the dam itself. This is very short-sighted. Dr. Borlaug, could you just uh, give us some idea of what sorts of thoughts go through your mind when you approach a new wheat field for the first time, how you go about sizing it up, how you go about diagnosing what's happening there? Uh, with the considerable experience, one's uh, soon learns to sort of weigh many factors that together make up final yield levels. Uh, the first thing I look at when I go in a farm, farmer's field is how many heads are there if it's at the heading stage or post-heading stage? How many heads are there per square meter? Is the field uniform? Because after all, if you're looking at a representative piece and you see how many heads and how big the heads are, more or less how many grains uh, each head has, and if the field is uniform, you get a general picture of what it is likely to yield. Part of this is based on experience. Uh, are the leaves green? Do they look lush? Uh, which means that the, uh, that the crop is uh, well nourished, it's been properly fertilized. Are the leaves burning off? If they are, the chances are it has at one point or another been damaged by a shortage of moisture, drought. Uh, does it have any rust or diseases on it, rust in particular? Because these are devastating diseases uh, in the case of wheat when they occur in epidemic form. And, and so you pull off several leaves and you look at them. This one is beautifully green, it's healthy no disease of any kind. Uh, then of course, in addition, if you know the zone, the region where you're, the crop is being grown, you know what the temperature regime is likely to be. For example here, knowing Sonora as I do now, uh, this crop is beyond the stage where uh, a few days of high temperature uh, will seriously reduce yield of grain. If, the, if you get temperatures in the range of uh, 34, 5 or 6, when the grain is just beginning to fill, this will greatly re reduce the, the yield per hectare of grain. The desiccation is such that the plant can't pump out enough water to resupply the tissues and the result is in the end that uh, uh, the plant suffers and reflects in a greatly reduced uh, yield. Knowing the, uh, knowing the region then, uh, this helps you anticipate what other factors might come in to affect the yield from this point of time on a plant development until the harvest. Now there's one other thing that uh, uh, you can't tell until 
Uh, the grain is actually harvested generally, generally then I like to shell out the grains that are in the head and look at the size of the grain and the plumpness of the grain, especially the plumpness. The size of the grain is uh, largely uh, the result of the breeding of the variety. But whether the grain is filled or whether it tends to be thin and shrunken is frequently a combination of uh, adverse effects, either of too high a temperature or of shortage of moisture at some point in the uh, development of that grain. This tool gives a little insight on, into what one would uh, expect. And in this field, for example, there's another uh, factor. Uh, you will see there's virtually no weeds present. And weeds are competitors and uh, will reduce the uh, yield of the crop. Nor is there any lodging of any magnitude. And lodging is a factor that reduces yield. And especially if this lodging occurs uh, at time of heading or shortly thereafter before the grain is well filled. In any case, even if it lodges when the grain is already filled, it makes it much more difficult to harvest, whether that be a harvesting operation with a hand sickle or whether it be with a combine. Uh, the costs of harvesting go up very greatly as a result of that uh, lodging. Then, of course, you might lose much of the grain standing in the field. If the variety is one that is not suited to the environment, and especially if it's a very dry uh, climate at time of harvesting, some varieties will shell out or shatter, and you can lose a considerable amount of your harvest if you have winds, an extremely dry atmosphere, low relative humidity, and if the variety is not designed to resist that shattering, that too can adversely affect the yield. But again, this crop is made, barring a hailstorm, and here we don't happen to have hails. Uh, but there are many parts of the world where a crop that is that close to harvest can be demolished completely by hail. But hail are generally of rather local uh, nature, a narrow strip that may go for quite a few miles. And they're devastating, but they are not like frosts. Frost at time of flowering uh, generally may destroy the crop over large areas because low temperatures tend to be more generalized in a large area than the hail, which is generally a narrow strip. These two, both of them, have the potential to very adversely affect uh, yields and production. Of course, here we're looking at a crop of wheat that's approaching maturity. This is only about two weeks away from harvest. If one goes into a field when the wheat is small, uh, only a few weeks old, then the way of evaluating the potential of that crop is very different. Immediately you can see where there are great deficiencies of nitrogen. The plants are yellow. And uh, frequently there are very few tillers. Tillers, I mean, uh, uh, sons and daughters that grow up from the one seed that germinates, that gives many heads per plant. Uh, these plants are poorly tillered. First, they're yellow if it's a shortage of nitrogen. Secondly, they have not tillered. Frequently, if they have not tillered, you pull up the seedling, and if the root development is particularly bad, uh, quite often, it's one indication of the uh, great shortage of uh, phosphate. Uh, in some places you will see seedlings where the leaves are beginning to die. Almost always this is a drought stress. There might be something toxic or again a deficiency. Uh, but you weigh these various possibilities uh, on what you see now by digging in the soil to see what the moisture conditions are. And all of these help you uh, sort of uh, make a judgment on what the principal factors are that are involved in making this particular field, uh, if it happens to be a bad one, why is it bad? Uh, 
in contrast to one planted at the same time in a neighbor's field where the plants may be vigorous, green, uh, where they're tillering uh, abundantly, where they're establishing a complete cover on the ground in a, in a few short weeks' time, whereas the others are a few spindly plants here and there. Now, sometimes you see very spotty uh, fields of young plants also. This can be due to several things, a poor seed bed and poor distribution of uh, the seed itself, or lack of moisture to sprout uniformly the seed that was distributed. <clears throat> or it may be bad seed that had low gen uh, germination. There are various factors that can adversely uh, affect a newly established uh, field of wheat or give the impression that something was wrong. And it's frequently, of course, not one thing, but it's a combination of uh, a number of factors. Uh, the good farmer, the really good farmer, is the person who can put all the pieces together. And the timing of the manipulation of all of these factors in the new package of technology is uh, of great importance. Uh, what's the proper date, date of planting? Well, better yet, start back. A uh, proper time of preparation of the land for planting. Then the right date of planting, the right density of seed or seeding, uh, the right fertilization prior to seeding, and the water control, if it's an irrigated thing, when do you irrigate and at what intervals. Uh, all of these have to be timed properly. The control of weeds, if it's going to be done chemically, this is very critical. Uh, frequently, if you apply a, a herbicide too early, you will get damage to the young seedlings. If you apply it too late, you, the heads will be twisted and gnarled and uh, the number of grains will be reduced over what they should be. Uh, so this timing is very important. The choice of the right variety. Sometimes we see farmers continuing to grow a variety that has become obsolete. I say obsolete because although it was distributed four or five years ago perhaps as a variety resistant to let's say stem rust there have been mutations in the fungus uh, they have become uh, capable of attacking the variety that was formerly resistant and then it becomes dangerous to grow it because if many farmers continue to grow that an epidemic can build up very rapidly and uh, you can lose half of your harvest by shrunken seed, it sets fewer seeds also. Or if it's stem rust, you can get a complete kill. You can lose the entire crop. So these two are important considerations. And that means that the development of new varieties with the proper disease resistance must be a continuous process. We know we will not be able to uh, produce a variety that will remain disease resistant for an indefinite period, perpetually, if you permit me to use that. So we've got to have one echelon of new breeding materials coming beyond the, behind the other to, and when we monitor the pathogens, the rust fungi in farmers' fields, we generally have a warning of two or three years before we will have epidemics. And then we must multiply rapidly the new ones that have been showing outstanding performance in competition with the main commercial varieties of today and get them into farmers hands before we have an explosive epidemic. Now plants talk to you. Uh, they tell you whether by these symptoms that I have just been uh, trying to describe, uh, whether they're healthy, whether they're happy, and the way they grow and develop is an outward manifestation of this. And I always try to uh, tell the young uh, scientists who come to Simit for training that the plants will talk in a quiet, intelligent voice. If you're in the field with them, and if you go there often enough, constantly, to see the changes that are taking place during the course of the season. But those plants whisper, especially when they're in the early stages of uh, difficulties. And they won't be heard in the minister's office 
in the capital city of the world, nor in the ivory towers of the greatest of the universities of the host country. So, I repeat, they whisper. And that means you have to live with them. You have to feel their pulse. You have to see what uh, is happening to this crop. And uh, this calls for traveling the countryside in the area that you are responsible for as it relates to both research and crop production. And uh, what you see and observe is important to giving guidance to proper policy at top government levels. Also, I think we all need to recognize that the top policy makers must, insofar as possible, become familiar not with the whispers of the wheat crop, but of the general uh, outlook of the factors that have to be brought together to produce the final effect. And uh, this means that at the right level in government, there has to be good communication with the people responsible for research, extension, uh, education, and production, meaning uh, the farmer. And the farmers are all too often, especially in the small farmers, uh, sort of uh, uh, not given enough consideration. Uh, you will frequently say that uh, here heard, uh, here said that uh, but many of our farmers are illiterate. But there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's no correlation with literacy and with shrewdness in making the right judgments if they have been properly demonstrated in the use of new technology. And if the economic policies are such that that can be adopted, adapted and put into practice, he will move and he will move surprisingly fast. We have seen this time and time again. First here in Mexico, in my uh, experience, we've seen it in Turkey, we've seen it in Tunisia, we've seen it in India, in Pakistan, in Argentina, in many places. And when the technology has been developed uh, and the policies are not right, uh, such as it has been the case in Argentina, uh, pricing policies, availability of inputs at reasonable prices, uh, the, po uh, the technology cannot be applied. Uh, we had this technology that could have drastically changed uh, wheat production in Argentina by 65. It's only now being applied because of changes in policy, which uh, makes it remunerative to farmers to adopt the technology. Sometimes a third of the world market price and exported uh, the part that wasn't needed for domestic consumption at the international market price good business for filling the coffers of government, but it's a damn poor thing to stimulate production, which in the long run, if properly balanced, would produce more income for government.